Okay, everyone, we're going to get started. Welcome again to A Place to Call Home. Thank you for joining us today to talk about housing justice policy at the federal level. This webinar is being recorded and will be shared with the participants soon. If you haven't introduced yourself yet in the chat, please do so. And uh, I am going to turn it over right now to Farhan McClurkin from the Neighborhood Funders Group for a brief welcome. Hi, everybody, and thanks, Miriam. Um, my name is Farhan McClurkin, and I'm the Vice President of Programs at Neighborhood Funders Group. And we're um, called uh, NFG, sort of for short. And we're a national network of grant makers concerned with racial, economic, gender, and climate justice. And obviously we see housing as being something that is absolutely critical to all of those goals. So for any funders that are funding in those areas are interested in advancing um, equity and justice in any of those areas, we have to talk about home. And as I was preparing for this webinar, I was sort of thinking about home as a concept and I was thinking, what's the first thing that comes to mind when I think about home? And some of the phrases that came to mind are the everyday phrases that you hear, like home sweet home, there's no place like home, the best journey takes you home. And I was just thinking right now, as the pandemic continues to rage, that tens of millions of people are in danger of losing their housing. And these are people from all walks of life and our members members of our community. These are our family members. These are people close to us. And as we strive to continue to curb the pandemic and make this country more equitable and just, we can't forget that this is a basic need and necessity that is critical to not only goals related to equity and justice, but also to stopping the pandemic, to creating um, economic vitality and other things. And that's why NFG is really happy to be here, um, uh, co-sponsoring this webinar. Um, and I, I just wanna really encourage folks as we hear about these policy proposals to think about what you can do to actually further um, making housing more equitable to help support a federal agenda that can make that real intangible. And we're trying to do that in the Democratizing Development Program, which is a program of NFGs that's focused on place-based and national strategies around community power building related to housing. So I'll leave it there. Um, but um, uh, thanks uh, for sh to Shelter Force um, and Funders Together to End Homelessness for hosting this. And I will pass to my colleague, Amy Kenyon. Thanks, Karan. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Amy Kenyon. I am a program officer at the Ford Foundation and uh, help to support the Playbook Project or the New Deal for Housing Justice report. Uh, so I wanna welcome you all to this call. We all know that housing justice is an incredibly important issue, central to both racial and economic justice. And the pandemic especially has brought that into such sharp relief this past year. We also know that the federal government has a critical role to play. It is federal policy and investments that shaped the housing systems and the outcomes that we have now. And it will take federal action to create a future that really addresses the injustice and inequities that are baked into the current system. What I wanna emphasize about today's conversation is that these policy agendas that we're gonna to get to hear about were shaped by people closest to the issues of housing and racial justice. These agendas are not incremental ideas to reform the system and make it just a little bit better. Rather, they're transformative ones that take into account questions of power and racial justice at their core. I believe our job as funders, I'm glad that there's so many uh, folks from philanthropy institutions on this call. Our job, I believe, is to listen and learn from and move resources in alignment with the priorities of those most impacted by inequality and injustice. So I'm grateful to Neighborhood Funders Group and Shelter Force for giving the, us this opportunity to learn about these policy agendas for racial justice and housing. So welcome and thank you. And I'll turn it over to you, Miriam.
And I'll my, thank you, Amy and Farhan, uh, for your support. And thanks to Funders Together to End Homelessness also for supporting this event. So I'm Miriam Axelute. I'm the CEO and editor in chief of Shelter Force magazine. For those not familiar with us, uh, Shelter Force is a 46 year old media organization that covers community development and housing justice. We uh, love to get down in the thick of how to make this stuff happen and support the people who are doing this important work on the ground. We publish several times a week with a combination of reported journalism and lifting up practitioner and organizer voices. You can follow us on social media or subscribe to our emails uh, at least weekly. So I've been wanting to do this panel on this topic literally since I first learned about the New Deal for Housing Justice process that it was underway and at around the same time read through the Breathe Acts housing section in detail. And so I'm so excited that it is uh, now underway and we're able to have this conversation with you all and grateful to our partners at NFG for helping us put it together and making it happen. So today we have with us uh, Jennifer Cosillon, a Mellon ACLS Public Fellow at Community Change Action, where she's a policy advisor. Community Change managed the New Deal for Housing Justice process and is now working on organizing support for implementing its priorities. We have Jeremy Greer, a co-executive director of Liberation in a Generation, who is a contributing author to the New Deal for Housing Justice. And we have Philip McCarris, a researcher with the Movement for Black Lives and a PhD candidate at Yale University. And so I'm so excited to be having this conversation with these great folks. And I'm gonna ask them first to just introduce themselves a little bit more than I just did telling us something about themselves and how they came to this work. And then we're gonna jump right into the meat of today's conversation. So um, why don't we start with Jennifer? Thank you, Miriam. Hello, everyone. Um, again, my name is Jennifer Cosleone and I come to this work through academia. I'm trained as a sociologist doing community engaged research and participatory action research. Um, so really tying research to policy and action. And um, some of the areas that I've studied have been urban poverty and inequality, local social movements, and uh, the ways in which that intersects with family life, as well as housing. So happy to be here. Great. Jeremy. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here. Um, my name is Jeremy Greer, co-executive director um, of Liberation in a Generation. Uh, we're a movement support organization that supports grassroots leaders to develop um, uh, anti-racist um, policies and economic policies. Um, I come to this work really starting out on the ground as a community organizer in, community, in uh, Columbia Heights uh, in Washington, D.C., and did it during a time when there was massive gentrification. Um, really moved from there to work for LIST, the local initiative support corporation, where I really um, seemed to be well steeped in, which gave me the kind of baptism into housing, national housing policy. And um, currently are using kind of what I've learned to uh, kind of build the kind of racial justice um, housing policies that we need to to move things forward, what you find in the um, in the playbook. And then I just as a note, I authored the uh, racial justice chapter of the um, the uh, New Deal for housing policy. Philip. Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm really uh, excited to be here today for this uh, conversation. Uh, so I'm a researcher. Um, I've been a researcher within the broader movement for Black Lives ecosystem um, over, the, over the last few years. And I'm also a PhD candidate at Yale um, uh, as a sociologist, where my research focuses on housing and policing and specifically uh, surrounds public housing. And yeah, so th those intersections have br brought me to this work. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. And just uh, in case anyone hears, the New Deal for Housing Justice was originally called the Housing Policy Playbook or when it was in process. So if you hear any of us slip into referring to the playbook, that's the same thing as the New Deal for Housing Justice. So just don't want anybody to be confused by that. So and let's start with uh, learning about what these things are. Jennifer, can you tell us about uh, why the New Deal for Housing Justice was created and what was the process that 
uh, you went through to create it? So the New Deal for Housing Justice puts forth a bold vision for housing policy, which is why it was created, because this is very much needed. It centers racial equity and it was created with input from a lot of folks. It included uh, 100 stakeholder interviews, over 400 ideas that were shared by grassroots leaders and advocates through an open call. And it's directly aligned with Community Change Action's vision for a path to power uh, for Black, Brown, and immigrant communities, because it really challenges our government to create housing that works for people who most need it. And um, it's ultimately about rebalancing power because a major form of instability for people in America is housing insecurity. And I think it's important for us to, to spend a little time talking about the main principles of the New Deal for Housing uh, to ground our conversation today. And among these include, you know, housing is a human right and a basic human need. Housing is community infrastructure for the common public good. Housing policy must be anti-discriminatory, anti-racist, and it must center the voices of directly impacted people, people who faced housing insecurity, people who've been homeless, people who live in public housing. And last, housing is a pathway to a more equitable communities in general. And, um, and so the New Deal for Housing Justice AKA the playbook was created as a guide for the new administration primarily, but as a whole, I think it does a really good job of pointing to the many ways in which housing intersects with virtually every other aspect of family life and how racial inequity within housing has impeded so many families from access uh, to better opportunities. And in turn, what we can do policy-wise to undo these harms Housing is so important. You know, where you live affects where your kids go to school, where you take them to the park, whether there's public transportation to get to work, where you live affects your options for childcare, for accessing medical needs, for being able to reach fresh food options. And the reality is that access to safe, affordable housing in the private market has been out of reach for many families. And this is largely because of the color of their skin how they pay their rent, and, and also how we define affordability. And so simultaneously, public housing investment and subsidized rent assistance is inadequate to meet, you know, compared to the need that we have in our country. And so um, I'm excited to be here to talk about that and to, to share the stage with folks like Jeremy on our panel who were uh, part of writing uh, sections of, of the playbook, um, in his case, uh, the racial justice section. So thanks again for, for having this space to, to have a conversation about this very important um, topic. Great. So Jeremy, you know, pretty much at every transfer of power, affordable housing advocates, like advocates of every cause, right, they generate these lists of recommendations for the new administration. How is the New Deal for Housing Justice different from these typical documents that that people generate every four to eight years yeah and um you know jennifer went over some of them but i'm going to hone in on the one that i think is really distinguishes this one from others and that is its focus on centering racial justice and doing it in a couple ways one and that it not only does a, a very focused look at policies that could actually advance racial justice for example there's two chapters one that I, that that i wrote on um racial justice itself and then one that focuses in on the racial wealth gap so it does very focused looks at at policies that would advance racial justice but it also integrates racial justice into other sections like around public housing homelessness, um, rural housing, and in other places within the housing market. So it so it doesn't make that false choice that people actually often do where it's like, well, do we do we integrate it through all or do we focus it? It actually does both. It focuses and it integrates through a whole set of other policies. The other way that I think is important is that it actually diagnoses the problem differently than I think other housing um, uh, 
platforms and, and agendas have done in the past. And the problem that is so traditionally, it's like, you know, race is like this externality and racial disparities are this externality that just kind of happen within the housing market. And then the job of policy is to try to correct for these like market failures that that create disparity between like black renters and Latinx renters and white renters is this kind of thing, but it's kind of bound into an assumption that the market is, is not the problem, that there's just these things that happen that we need to fix. This actually diagnoses the problem differently and that actually the market itself is racist, that racism is built in and baked into the, the housing market and it has been since its inception all the way from, you know, indigenous land that was taken um, when the settlers got here to, to slavery and then sharecropping and Jim Crow and so on and so on. And what it does is when you look at it from that perspective, you actually think about policies that are not going to correct for problems, but actually create new systems that stop oppression and start to build the kind of housing market that works for black, brown, indigenous, and other people of color. So I think it takes, through a different diagnosis, I think we land on a different way of approaching some of the housing problems and develop different solutions um, to move forward. So, yeah. Great, thanks. Let's bring the BREATHE Act into this. Um, Philip, can you give us some background about how it was drafted, what it covers and what role housing plays in it? Sure, for sure. So, so the BREATHE Act is, is actually a, a wide reaching omnibus bill and it builds on the Invest Divest platform a uh, piece that was previously published by the Movement for Black Lives um, that was titled The Vision for Black Lives. Um, and particularly in this uh, you know, moment in, in light of nationwide calls to defund and reallocate police funding and divest from uh, systems of punishment. And so uh, insofar as that it, it centers divesting from systems of punishment um, and harm such as policing and prisons and investing in community resources uh, and alternative systems of safety. And so given the centrality of housing and, and creating safe, stable communities, housing is, is, uh, is a central piece of focus in the, the key areas of, of uh, investments within communities. And so taken directly from the, the Breathe Act language, um, you know, this visionary bill divests our taxpayer dollars from brutal and discriminatory policing and invest in a new vision of public safety, um, a vision that answers the call to defund the police and allows all communities to finally breathe free. And I think, you know, again, it's, it's important here to, um, in the framing, it, it centers both uh, building up communities and community resources and, and capacity through, uh, you know, healthcare, education, um, employment, and specifically, you know, again, housing is, is a key piece, but also envisioning other, other forms of um, uh, safety interventions. Um, that actually keep folks safe. And, you know, of course, you know, in, in within the Breathe Act, housing is a fundamental right. Um, and, and as as it uh, is written, that has far uh, too long been made out of reach to Black, Latinx, and Indigenous, and other communities of color. Um, and especially given its history of racial discriminatory housing policies and practices, the federal government must ensure that historically excluded groups have meaningful access to affordable housing. Um, and so the, of course, the, the, the federal piece, and it's written as a bill, um, as a federal bill that can also be applied at, at state levels. And it, the Breathe Act was drafted by the Electoral uh, Justice Project by the Movement for Black Lives. And, and um, I know we'll get into it a bit more later, but um, the, the proposed policies um, overlap a lot uh, with the, the New Deal on housing justice. Um, and some of them, you know, just to name some, you know, it, it, it includes uh, investments in a, a robust social housing um, uh, development program, um, you know, uh, money to address the, the public housing um, backlogs of repairs, um, fully funding uh, Section 8 vouchers and, and a number of other, uh, as well as, as creating pathways for affordable housing. Um, yeah, and so, you know, we know that safe housing reduces, uh, you know, the likelihood of, of, of um, harm and conflict and violence within communities. and it cultivates safety and provides a central base for building secure and stable communities. And so, you know, this, this housing piece, of course, is, is a central focus and I'm looking forward to talking more about it. Great, thanks. And so for that, 
you just listed a couple of examples of the kinds of things that come into the BREATHE Act. Uh, Jeremy, can you similarly give us a sense of the kind of scope of what's encompassed in the New Deal for housing justice? Yeah, and it's really it's really comprehensive. Um, it's you know, one what we as as Jennifer mentioned. Uh, we wanted to make sure that it was germane to this current administration. So it, the, the, the solutions are broken out in buckets of like things that could be done on day one, which we passed, um, things that could be done in the first 100 days, and then things that could be thought about in the first 200 days, but then also be springboards to longer term kind of substantial change in the housing market. And in doing so, and because of and the reason for that is because there's this acknowledgement that the systemic rate things like systemic racism have been built into our system over time and there's a real need to, to take the time to really dismantle those systems but that we can start that work like now so there's there's that piece in there and like i said it covers things like um rural housing homelessness public housing it includes um intersectional things like health and housing the environment and housing um, income supports in housing. There's policies around that. There's also things around like what, what we call in the, the playbook culture change. You know, like what is it, the what is the culture of these agencies that need to change? What are the type of personnel that they need to have? The restructuring that may need to be done to, to carry out policy in a better way. And um, I'll just highlight kind of two things that I think are unique again to this is um, a, there's a real focus on the current moment and COVID-19, which I think we'll dive into um, in a little bit, uh, but also um, really, and I think that you'll see this in this, uh, I haven't seen this yet in other kind of housing platforms, but there's a call for a real conversation of providing reparations for re for anti-Black policies that have been baked into our housing system. And it's very specific and focused on that. It calls for a commission that it, that is made up of, of people who are affected by housing insecurity. Um, so there's, there's a set of policies that are really looking to bring folks from the ground in to address real systemic problems that are within our housing system. And that's an example of, of one that um, I think is that you, I, I haven't seen in other um, policy uh, uh, platforms, housing policy platforms that are out there. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, do you want to um, lift up any of the components of the New Deal that you think are particularly top priority? right now? Yeah, so for community change action, we can, you know, they could be organized into three interconnected phases or areas. And, you know, the first most immediate area is COVID relief, things like rent, rent relief, and ensuring that this, uh, this reaches communities that are in most need, especially communities of color. Um, and, um, reversing harmful uh, rule changes and executive actions of the previous administration. And so that's, I think, top priority. Uh, the second is, is making investments in housing infrastructure and uh, affordable housing. And then the third is around uh, systems change. And so, um, you know, centering people with lived experiences. Um, looking at different ways of of making sure that people have enough to pay rent, like a uh, universal basic income pilot. Um, and as Jeremy mentioned, uh, making reparations to black people for the decades and decades of exclusion uh, so that we can stop racial inequity uh, in its tracks now. Great. Jeremy, were there any other top priority items you wanted to lift up? Yeah, I think one that I, I, I want to lift up and um, Philip mentioned it, and I think it's a real um, intersection with the Breathe Act is the um, 
actually thinking about creating social housing, creating a set of housing stock that is outside of the market-based system that has been so extractive to black and brown people and to, you know, the Breathe Act sets a really strong marker for how much is needed and the way that the play, what that play with the new deal for uh, housing justice, uh, I think reinforces that is that there's a call again for a commission to really um, study uh, what a social housing um, system in the United States would look like. And again, doing it with affected people who experience housing insecurity as key inputs into what the design of that would look like. Um, and not just relying on academics and policy folks in Washington to do that. So that's one other thing I, like, I think is worth holding up. Great. And Philip, do you wanna lift up and describe what you think are the top priority items in the Breathe Act housing section? Yeah, for sure. So so the, the top areas I would say, um, you know, the, the housing area focuses on, um, you know, the, of course, the clearing the, the public housing repair backlogs, um, which, you know, have ran rampant for, for a very long period of time and, and fundamentally shapes everyday experiences um, and hazard within uh, uh, public housing context. Um, and then, you know, the next piece is around building 12 million new social housing uh, units across the U.S. Um, you know, another important piece is, is pathways to uh, home ownership, specific, specifically to address legacies of housing discrimination and redlining, um, as well as expanding affordable housing, uh, you know, robust tenant protections. Um, and again, so, it, you know, it, it's detailed in a way that is written to be adopted at the federal and state levels, and it provides um, detailed visions of immediate steps, you know, that can be taken to, to attend within the, the uh, now. Um, as well as charts a, a vision for, for um, a much more transformative vision for housing that, um, as Jeremy mentioned, you know, specifically in, in you know, uh, again, it's, it's, it's a key part of my work as well as is to create also housing that's free of um, extractive and predatory uh, market, you know, practices and, and, um, and patterns um, that have, have led and, and have exacerbated, you know, racial inequality in a variety of ways. Um, so yeah, so I think those are those are the, the key pieces that I would say. Miriam, can I jump in again on um, on COVID nineteen? Um, so in the in the um, the New Deal for racial justice, there's a real focus on on COVID-19 that, um, you know, Jennifer mentioned. And I'll say that it was a real push from the advisors of the um, of the, the document to say like, we really need to make sure that this addresses it. And it really focuses on two things, really like keeping folks in their homes because we know that one of the best ways to fight the virus is to be able for people to be able to, to shelter in place in their homes and that, for too long that in our current crisis, people have not been able to do that because of housing insecurity. And unfortunately, in some places, you know, the carceral system becomes a way in which they are, you know, housing people who don't have housing um, in, in this pandemic and that that shouldn't be. So that the real focus should be on keeping people in their homes, whether they're homeowners or renters. And then the second piece is being ready to respond to the economic crisis that this is going to cause. So, you know, there's this backlog in rent, there's these backlog in mortgages, and we could expect there to be a housing crisis that is created by that, where there are a lot of vacant properties across the country, like we saw in the last kind of economic downturn, and that there's a real role for the federal government to make sure that if there are going to, if we cannot stop, keep people in their home, and there are foreclosures, of multifamily units and single family units, that we have the resources that, that communities can control those properties and that they're not grabbed up by speculators. So one of the things that the New Deal for Housing Justice calls for is an acquisition fund so that communities can, can get control of the properties that are gonna be available um, in, in, the how, you know, in the market uh, once we, once eviction moratoriums are lifted and foreclosure moratoriums are listed and things like that. So I just wanted to make sure that we didn't get past without mentioning that that part of the, uh, the um, housing justice um, platform is, is, is critically important. Yeah. 
Sorry, you know, that that just reminded me as well. Um, that like another central piece that I would say is 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 around uh, the Breathe Act uh, puts forth a housing restoration fund, which is a pilot program that uses federal funds to help communities uh, buy, transfer ownership of, and restore um, abandoned properties. Um, which you know, over the past year, we we've seen the ways in which different uh, community organizers have, um, uh, you know, organized to to. Uh, have ownership over over abandoned um, properties in a fund to to redevelop and, and retrofit them, and yes, I, I just wanted to mention. I think you know that, that's another piece that I would say. One thing too that I'd like to add on is in a, in terms of eviction moratoriums, the the New Deal for Housing Justice talks about this as a necessity that is automatically triggered when there's a national uh, you know, state of disaster or emergency, instead of us having to push the date month by month, that is now you know, the CDC eviction moratorium set to expire at the end of the month. And, um, and, you know, and also finding ways of, of making sure that people stay housed. Eviction moratoriums don't stop evictions, they just prolong them. And so I think that that's really important for us. Um, once people are in eviction court, many of them are unrepresented. Many of them are people of color. And, um, and this is a, a systemic issue that we need to address as well. Great. I think that leads uh, nicely into what's going on at the federal level right now. So it is the 55th day, I believe, of the Biden administration. The Senate has passed a stimulus bill that contains some rent relief provisions. So um, starting with you, Jennifer, can you talk a little bit about the current state of housing justice related provisions at the federal level? What's been proposed, what's been passed, and how does it align with these larger visions that the New Deal and the BREATHE Act are putting forward? Thanks, Miriam. So last I heard is today the House will be voting on a bill that the Senate sent over and uh, in it includes some funds for housing, uh, really necessary uh, funding for housing assistance and homelessness. Uh, the last time I saw the bill it was 27 billion for uh, rental assistance and 10 billion for homeowners assistance. Um, and, you know, it does not extend an eviction moratorium and uh, largely, um, you know, having to do with the, the non-budgetary implications of how this passed through uh, budget reconciliation process um, or is attempting to be passed in that way. Um, and, you know, and so at Community Change Action, we, we along with others in um, you know, in the field who have worked and advocated for, uh, you know, for housing justice, uh, see a much greater need. I mean, six months ago, we were fighting for 100 billion for, uh, you know, rental assistance alone. And so um, it's a, it's a step, right, that, that we're taking, but much more is needed to meet the current moment, to meet the need to to make sure that people stay in their homes when they have, you know, on average six, seven thousand dollars of back rent due, um, when up to forty million people are at risk of of getting kicked out of their homes, and so um, it's it's inadequate, but um, but it's a start. Jeremy, do you have uh, things to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I. I... I think it's positive to see what's happening in the Congress. Um, and I think the, the, but also the limitations of the process that they went through, I think means that there's a lot more work to do. And I think it makes, we have to then look at the Biden administration to see what they can do. Um, you know, I think they can still, ex they have the power to extend those moratoriums um, beyond what Congress has done through the CDC. Um, so, so they should, she should look to do that. One place that I think that, that I want to highlight that um, actually, you know, like I said, we, we did these things and like we, we, we as authors bulk things in like one, one on day one, 
100 day, um, you know, 200 day. And one thing that they did, and, you know, I mentioned earlier that there's like real systemic racism that is like built into the design of our housing system. And it's also built into the design of our housing policies. And one thing that the, the, the president did that um, wasn't exactly what we act, asked for, but I think has echoes of what we, what we asked for in the, um, in the New Deal uh, document was to do a racial wealth audit of housing programs, to look at housing programs and say, okay, ask questions like, are they doing harm? to black, brown, indigenous, and other people of color, um, and, or, and can they do better? Like within the structures and the power of the administration, can they reorganize these programs in order to do better? And we, we said that, that each housing agency, HUD, um, the Federal Housing Finance Agency, um, the Office of Comptroller, um, they should look at these policies that they have and see, are they doing harm and can they do better? And the, the Biden administration, some of you may know, issued an order basically calling on all federal agencies, which would include all of the housing agencies, to do a racial analysis of their programs to see if they are um, having disproportionate or unfair um, impact on communities of color. So I think that that is a step in the right direction. I think it could do, could it, could it do more and be more robust? Of course it could. But I think it, it has echoes of some of the things that we were calling for um, in the New Deal platform that we're already seeing the Biden administration um, put pen to paper and actually implement. Philip, did you uh, want to add anything on what was going on at the in the federal level currently? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you know, I think that that uh, what Jeremy and Jennifer said kind of you know covers it. I think um, you know, a part of the M4BL's push has been, of course, the moratorium and, and uh, cancellation of rents um, and evictions. And so, you know, I, you know, I think there there there's you know, been some some relief, but I think that as of right now, it's it's still uh, you know a pending avalanche of, of housing insecurity and, and uh, evictions, if absent of any kind of real sort of transformative um, immediate relief and long term visions for for uh, envisioning housing justice. Great. Let's let's kind of dig into that process in terms of of pushing. So the New Deal for Housing Justice, as Jeremy mentioned, has laid out some shorter term steps, day one, day 100. Um, the BREATHE Act kind of goes for broke, starting right up front with allocate $1 trillion to social housing. They're both going toward the same direction. Um, but how do you differentiate between reforms that tweak but don't move us toward those larger structural changes and interim steps that are moving us in the right direction. Let's start with Jennifer. So um, tweaking the existing system is funding programs that are underfunded a little more without addressing the underlying issues that exist in those programs. And uh, one example is the housing choice voucher program where one in four tenants who are eligible are able to receive a voucher. And of those who do have a voucher in hand, oftentimes they face uh, discrimination. They um, are steered to live in racially segregated areas, higher poverty areas. And, um, and they also have faced source of income discrimination. And so reforms that open doors for more systemic change include those that would offer tenant protections through, as discussed in the Housing Justice Playbook, Federal Tenant Bill of Rights, just cause evictions, um, you know, <clears throat> ending zoning laws that discriminate, add, adding source of income protections. Um, and, and thinking about, like I mentioned before, you know, your universal basic income options for families uh, to have enough with uh, to pay the, the rising costs of, of rent. You know, uh, there's not a single state or county 
or metro area in the US where a minimum wage worker can afford a two bedroom apartment or unit without spending more than 30% of their income, which would be them being rent burdened. And so this is, this is a problem. And, um, and so addressing these kinds of, of issues is key to more systemic change and also recognizing the legacy of racism in, the, in this country and making uh, reparations for that, I think is key. Great. Heather, Philip or Jeremy want to follow up on that? Great. Oh, I, I can. Um, I mean, I think the big thing for me is like this incremental versus long-term and I, the balance we were trying to capture in the New Deal um, is what can be done today to um, normalize conversations around big, bold transformational policy change that is needed. And because we know that that is a process, so like the ideas that are in the BREATHE Act, like what can we do to start to normalize a conversation about social housing, for example? And that's that's how we came up with the commission idea because right now these things are on the margins and they're on the fringes and they're not really a part of pol political dialogue in Washington, DC. So, so it's what can we do today in the first 100, 200 days in the first part of this administration to begin to normalize conversations about social housing in Washington circles. So it isn't this thing that kind of lives on the margins and politicians can continue to ignore and not pay attention to. Yeah, yeah, and just to follow up on that, I think, you know, and in, in when I think about sort of like the reform versus like bold transformation, I think to me, the marker sort of does it break with, you know, the current sort of paradigm or the current sort of model. And I think there's certain things that, that sort of can be implemented within the current model that doesn't sort of lead to, to a big sort of break and then but I think for the true transformation it, it requires some sort of breaking or some sort of working outside of the, the, the current framework and I think um, you know as Jeremy mentioned in the context of, of social housing you know for a long time you know for decades public housing was seen as something that was just a failure right that it was some somehow a failure of either design or, or uh, planning but you know we know that that uh, history is, is not true um, in the way it's often presented, and that it's 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 intimately tied to anti-black narratives and and you know uh, conflations of um, uh, the issues that emerge from poverty and 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 what happens when you divest from a housing context and not invest in it, and so normalizing a conversation where it's because the the you know the shift has been away from social housing or in publicly uh, funded housing, and so. Creating a context where that is then normalized and and and, and pushing for bold, uh, transformative de demands that sh that again break outside of, of of the current framework or model. I think is is at least not how I usually uh, and what how I usually sort of differentiate. Uh, yeah. yeah. Can, can you can I just chime in really quick to respond to to, to this? I think that the Philip that you hit the nail on the head. You know we we have moved away from building public housing towards this voucher system. I mean, um, since the 1990s, we have not built public housing. And the public housing that exists, we lose about 10,000 units a year because of uh, it's the disinvestment. Uh, there's a backlog of $75 million for public housing repairs. And I see in the chat, folks are, are mentioning uh, you know, land trust and housing trust funds. We need to invest in in at least twenty billion dollars in uh, the federal housing trust fund. And so, finding ways of community ownership and also expanding social housing so that everybody has a place to call home. Housing is a basic, basic human need. It should not be a commodity, and we need to shift the conversation um, to that very um, important fact. I wanted to follow up with that a little bit. Um, Philip, you mentioned you know, funding the capital needs of public housing and the way that the federal government has approached the, the capital falling apart of public housing recently is with the RAD program and which involves you know, trying to bring in private money because it was deemed just sort of impossible to actually allocate enough 
money directly to public housing. And so you know, the Breathe Act and, and the New Deal for Housing Justice are trying to pull us away from that assumption that this is impossible. Could you talk a little bit more about that kind of tension between going for the, the larger thing that has um, an aura of, of a bigger lift around it? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I think, um, you know, increasingly the, the I mean, the, the first wave of this, right, specifically around public housing was, um, you know, Hope Six. And we know that, you know, it, it displaced a num like public housing residents, uh, you know, and, and it came with a number of consequences. And, and in some contexts, it did, you know, redevelop areas, but the people who lived in public housing before weren't around to see the, the changes after. Um, and so, you know, now that the current sort of model is that the rental assistance demonstration program that the RAD initiative, which, you know, at least in terms of the, the, the alleged sort of aim is to, to build on it and to try to avoid the harms that were caused by Hope Six. But what we see is that when, when it's been implemented, um, evictions have soared, uh, you know, people have still made, you know, complaints around the, the, the quality of the repairs. Um, you know, people were, were supposed to be allowed back into their homes, but, you know, they weren't in some cases, there were rent increases. And so, you know, what we continue to see is that when things are pushed into, you know, the market, that market forces tend to uh, create a context of extraction and, and, and predatory practices. Um, and that if you have public housing and social housing that, you know, uh, can be free of those market factors, it can, it can greatly increase the likelihood of, of being able to create safe and stable communities that, that don't have this sort of um, broader context of extraction. But the model that has existed is to go into the market, right, whether that's, you know, creating uh, private funds in, in New York City, for example, and, and something that, that I've been working on is around you know, it's it's the it's the transfer to private management of NYCHA public housing, which the mayor has announced that one third of it will be shifted. But it's also it's created the the avenues that uh, open air uh, space within public housing context in New York City can be sold. So you know, the park in the public housing context that was you know historically a space for a gathering or a parking lot or the basketball court can now be sold to private developers which you know, removes public space. And, and we know that public space, green space has a number of uh, beneficial uh, positive effects for, for communities. And so, you know, again, I think that there's, there's this push towards market driven sort of solutions that we have seen time and time again have led to evictions, displacement, uh, you know, and, and these predatory practices. And so, you know, I think, and on the other side, what we, what we see is that there's no, there's, it's not, you know, a question of that there's not enough money, there's just not enough, you know, political will. And so I think, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely key and important that the resources exist. It, it's, and I think the conversation has to shift. And I think, you know, um, a part of that sort of uh, narrative condemnation of public housing, what is follow is then that the logical solution is to go into the market. And I think, so some of this, it, it requires a shift in how we're understanding and looking at, and also, um, you know, how we're, how we're sort of positioning solutions and, and how they sort of stand in relationship to, uh, you know, being centered on people and making sure people have housing as opposed to um, creating a context where, you know, big businesses and developers can can make money in, in some way. Great. Miriam, can I, can I, I know, I know you got a lot of questions, but this is so, okay. so rich. This is like, because Philip is spot on his analysis. And what I think for this group of funders, I think what's so important is that to understand what's happening in housing justice right now is that the, I believe the dynamic is shifting. I think we've, li we've lived in an era where I think academics and policy makers have driven the innovation and ideation in the housing field. And, you know, RAD, I think, is an example of that. Um, Hope Six is an example of what that has produced. I think what we're seeing now with, like, what you see coming through the Breathe Act, what uh, with community change taking the reins on developing uh, a new deal for housing justice, with the, the Homes Guarantee campaign um, and cancel rent um, getting so much traction, is what we're seeing is ideation coming from movement. 
and from people who are coming from the grassroots and people who are living the experience and that it's actual policy ideation that's coming from that place. And I, I'd say like, as you're thinking about like, how do I engage in this housing justice conversation? I think it's important to note that I feel like the, the dynamics are shifting around where the new and innovative ideas are coming from. And I think that is what is really exciting to me and really speaks to um, what, what Philip was talking about because what's driving those ideations is again, a different diagnosis of the problem that the problem is systemic racism and to dismantle systemic racism is the pathway to housing justice, so. Right, and that's a perfect lead into how we're, how we're using these two sets of policy proposals to, to try to move change. Um, so there, and they're two slightly different approaches to the same goal, but, um, can you guys talk about how you see both of them both interacting with each other and the movements that are supporting them? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think <clears throat> that the two are largely complementary from, from you know, my vantage point. And I think, um, you know, Jeremy's points out like a number of ways, you know, that they are. <clears throat> and, you know, one of the things that that you know I just wanted to sort of like echo is is around how <clears throat> like sort of these bold transformative demands are sort of coming out of movement and organizing spaces and sort of helping to to shift narratives and sort of both both from a perspective of the analysis of the issue but also the the proposal of, of what are solutions <clears throat> and I think that that's definitely you know key because you know I it's it's interesting because I, I you know when I read um, different, uh, uh, you know, toolkits, proposals, bills that sort of center on housing and justice, housing justice from um, and movement and organizing base, they, they, there tends to be a lot of overlap. And so the piece around social housing, for example, you know, it, it, it emerged there. If you look in like, you know, the Homes Guarantee playbook, if you like, if you go across, you know, from, from movement centered or um, organizations, you, you see a lot of these parallels. And I think, you know, a part of a big Part of that parallel is creating a context where where housing can be free of you know uh, of market pressures and i think that that the, the first time that that was introduced was was the new deal right it wasn't the 1930s but then you know as time shifted and and you know uh sort of market driven factors started to emerge and, and also as these programs started to be seen as sort of you know racialized right that when as that increasingly happened, there was a the result was to divest from it and to shift away from it, um, and to and to go towards these these other sorts of solutions. And so, you know, I think that uh, you know that is definitely key. And I think the Breathe Act in particular, because it comes out of you know in part from you know this 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 summer you know of of sort of an uprising around police violence, and you know because it it draws on the the invest divest platform from. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the vision for Black lives. I think it, it centers and, and, and focuses on um, investing in, you know, housing and other forms of, of community resources, but specifically, again, around divesting from systems of punishment that create harm and, and actually that these things are all tied together, right? Because when we see over time an increase in policing and imprisonment and funding around a police expenditure and, and, and uh, carceral expansion, that, that has occurred you know, you can look at the graphs that has occurred at the same time as we see divestments in things like housing and healthcare and education. Um, and I think as an analytical uh, springboard, it, it centers that that framework, um, as well as that framework that sort of shifts away from from the market. Um, so, you know, I think that they're, they're, they're largely sort of collaborative in many ways, um, and sort of in complementary. And I think, you know, the, the key thing that I'll say here is that it's, I, I do find it very, you know, fascinating because with the first time I read, uh, you know, the New Deal for, for Housing Justice, I saw overlaps with the Breathe Act and I saw overlaps with other, you know, movement centered housing organizations. Um, and, and a key part of that is it's, it's breaking from, you know, the current model that sort of policymakers and academics have said, you know, this is this, this is the, the affordable, you know, uh, you know, feasible solution to these issues, right? And and I think it's really breaking from that, and then sort of creating a new um, and shifting shifting paradigms in, in important ways. 
Yeah, I, I just doubled down on that point around the the connection isn't just between the New Deal for Housing Justice and the Breathe Act. There's also connection with the Homes Guarantee Campaign that's run by People's Action, the federal housing agenda from Center for Popular Democracy, the um, the, the there's these agendas across um oh right to the city has an agenda the alliance for housing justice you see these echoes of these same policies these kind of innovative policies that have kind of been shunned by mainstream affordable housing advocates for a long time and we're, i feel the energy building in these spaces to really bring together a kind of a mass movement to push some of these policies and again, normalize them in conversations around how do we fix this affordable housing problem that this country has created for black and brown people. So, yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. I think you, you know, the last sentence you said really hit home with me in terms of like how the country has created this for black and brown people, you know, um, mass incarceration is the criminalization of poverty in many ways. And we need to invest in housing. We need to incentivize local governments to invest in communities instead of locking people up since you know, most police are funded locally. Um, you know, Community change action fights for a more caring and inclusive economy with our partners. And this without a doubt means that we need to see housing as a basic human right. And it also means that we need to protect black lives from you know, social and economic state violence. And so uh, shifting away money from incarceration and policing towards systems of community safety that invest in people and communities that have seen disinvestment for decades and decades, uh, like housing infrastructure. So, uh, and something else I want to point out, we have to end the relationship between ICE and the police. We need to divest resources from private prisons and, you know, end the militarization of local and state police departments. And so, uh, you know, these are the things that, that America needs, that Black people need, that workers need in order to have real power over their futures and have a real fighting chance to thrive. And so we have these really exciting new um, sets of policy proposals that are not the same old, they're not the status quo. How are they being used by movements right now? What's their role in movements and how are, how are people organizing to push these policies forward? I'm happy to chime in here. Uh, so Community Change Action is, is active in engaging with field partners and uplifting uh, the issues raised of the New Deal for Housing and the policies raised in the, in the New Deal for Housing, which includes uh, you know, town hall events, planning congressional briefings uh, on the Hill and uh, district events. Wanna uh, shout out some of our partners that continue to fight for many of the points that were addressed in the New Deal for Housing. Uh, you know, residents organized for change or rock in Oregon helped to secure a statewide eviction moratorium that extends further than what we currently have at the federal level until the end of June. Uh, Washington can is organizing around good cause eviction protection, uh, which passed in the state house uh, for them. And, uh, you know, KC tenants in Kansas City uh, launched this zero eviction campaign in an effort to halt evictions. And they really shed light on the fact that hundreds of evictions are happening, even though there is a, a nationwide moratorium. And so, you know, state and local partners are being mindful about how federal policies um, affect them at the local level. They're continuing to fight as they have for decades, and they're continuing to hold federal and local governments accountable because it is it is organizers, it is the work of, of organizing that uh, put many legislators into office and um, now they have to answer to the people. Yeah, I, I'm seeing the same thing that, that, that Jennifer's seen across the country, but what I think is really uniting a lot of it again is 
people have been trapped in this diagnosis of like, we have to just focus on the affordability of the unit, which leaves out so much of what is driving the, 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 the housing insecurity that we're seeing. And what people are organizing around is really focus on systems of white supremacy, which land at who owns the property that people live in. And that is something that people, so, you know, you mentioned Casey Tennis, they've really focused on disrupting the eviction system, not just to keep people in their homes, which is of course the primary goal, but also to shed light on the extractive system in which we all have to operate in as a way to position a homes guarantee as a solution to dismantling that extractive system. And it's, it's not just KC tenants, it's groups across the country that are making those same connections that I that again is exciting me because it's connecting big national policy to people's real lived experiences and the activism and energy that's happening on the ground in communities. <clears throat> Yeah, no, I'll definitely just echo everything. And I think another, you know, example is, you know, Philadelphia Housing Action, you know, which which occupied, you know, a number of, of uh, um, abandoned uh, and vacant buildings in in um, uh, in Philadelphia, and then the city ended up, uh, you know, you know, they won this sort of this this battle in in sort of. There was this transfer of these buildings um, to a, so a, a community land trust, and so you know I think you know this is it, it's an example, but basically people sort of really just breaking for, from the mold, you know, because I think for a while people have been asking for, you know, safe places to stay and, and the like, and and we know that also in areas that you know there there is a higher likelihood of vacant and abandoned buildings. Often that is linked to historic practices of redlining and anti-black policies that you know and predatory and extractive, you know lending, you know, and so and so I think that, you know, people are really starting to really shift from the mold. And, you know, I think it's it's interactive in a lot of ways. I think, you know, there's these policy platforms and playbooks that come out that come from movements, and then it helps to, you know, even sharpen like the demands in movement. And I think there's this interactive effect that, um, you know, I think is really fruitful. And it, it's, it's, you know, really, really an exciting time, you know, I think. Great. And so let's talk a little bit about the affordable housing field. There's a lot of existing organizations out there who, who do lobbying in some of the more um, traditional ways that we've talked about, trying to keep existing programs sufficiently funded or making comments about rule changes, which can be very important. Um, but talk about why, you know, why it's important to get a broad cross-section of, of these housers to speak up and support these proposals that are coming out of, out of movement and what are the most useful kinds of things that um, existing affordable housing organizations can do to be supportive. I'm gonna start with Jeremy. Yeah, um, again, I just, I feel like the diet and you know, I've been in housing, I've been in conversations about housing policy for a long time um, and the focus on the affordability of the unit, which has driven housing policy development, it's driven housing policy advocacy, it's driven the strategies that we use to communicate with our, our elected officials is so limiting because it doesn't address what is driving housing insecurity, which is, again, who is owning and controlling the property and land that the people are being housed in. And by completely moving that out, I think we've landed on solutions that aren't gonna, gonna address the problem long-term or they're just band-aids. I mean, vouchers in a extractive capitalist market system are only gonna be a short-term solution forever. Like it's never gonna actually address the systemic racism that's baked into our system. So by focusing on, by shifting the focus on who controls the units and what are the, we holding those people accountable to, to the people that live in them is the pathway I believe to changing the system. And that means like cracking down on the speculative market, really pull, pulling back on corporate landlords and really putting some systems in place to protect renters against 
corporate landlords who just view all of these units as not as people living in apartments, but pieces on but but investments and assets on a on a spreadsheet. And th there has to be something and things like social housing are a movement in the direction of changing that dynamic in the housing system, community land trusts, co-op ownership, like all of these ideas that are out there in movement spaces are things that are, are going to, I believe, change the dynamics of the housing market in a way that is going to move us towards housing justice, but but being purely adherent to the private market and only worrying about how can we make that unit a little more affordable is not going to be the pathway to get there. And unfortunately, I feel like it's where our focus has been in housing and advocacy for, for decades, as long as I've been in it. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jennifer, you want to add in? Yeah. So, um, you know, I saw just now Pancella in the chat talking about, you know, who controls the units and who owns right, where people, where you live. And so um, one thing that we didn't mention, but is both in the playbook and the Breathe Act is to, you know, identify strategies and real supports for redressing communities that have been excluded from home ownership, for instance, and to give families and communities new access to home ownership. Um, and, and in terms of what uh, other groups can do is, is, you know, uplift the stories of people with lived experiences. It's, you know, one thing to see statistics and census poll surveys and another one to hear the, the stories and the people behind these numbers, because that's what it is, right? Um, th this is what's important, they're human lives and, and, and we need to, to really focus on this. Um, Ultimately, we've reached this current moment because of organizers and people power. So we'll continue to organize, support organizers, uh, hold legislators accountable, and um, and continue to fight until we dismantle systems of, of, of racial inequity that exist not only in housing, but in every other social structure in our society. Great. I want to make sure that we get to questions, so I'm going to ask one last question myself of the group, and then I'm going to start uh, pulling things out of the chat. So what, you know, we have a lot of funders here with us today. What can philanthropy do to make the most of this moment? And uh, why is it crucial that philanthropy find ways to support housing justice? Yeah, I can, I can start. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think sort of following this piece around transform live bold demands i think it's really you know important to fund the organizing work um, like community organizing tenant organizing resident organizing work um, folks that are sort of on the ground both trying to provide relief for everyday you know harm of these systems um, and housing injustice as well as sort of like build out new new models and i think you know as it goes with 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 other you know uh sort of organ, organizing and movements around around any issue. I think, you know, creating a context where organizers can organize and push for these bold transformative demands um, and have their sort of basic needs met and, and able to have the infrastructure and capacity to do that, you know, I think is, is an important area of, in terms of philanthropy and funding. And I think, importantly, I think, you know, tenant organizing and resident organizing is an area that there's not much of, of a philanthropic sort of uh, presence in. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, I'm thinking of my, the work that I do in like the, the, you know, public housing context where the, you know, tenant organizations are doing work to, you know, literally transform people's lives on a day to day and try to transform it in like lives in, in their housing context in the long front, long term, but have very limited resources and are often sort of, you know, both trying to change the conditions that they are themselves, you know, experiencing. And so I think creating a context where it can help to build out the infrastructure and platform and, and base for people to, to organize um, and really to partner with and in, in sort of in with with like not like with strings attached. I think that's a part of what I've seen with tenant organizing is that insofar as it's related to at times, uh, you know, housing authorities and the like being sort of the funds that the little funds that, that are you know provided being linked to that it, it sort of creates constraints in how much 
transformation you can actually push for. Um, and so I think that like funding with little strings attached for long-term periods of time, you know, folks that, that are at the, the helm of sort of working around, um, you know, really transforming housing conditions, both in the immediate and the long term, um, you know, and taking risks with, with, with organizations that are really pushing for transformation, because a part of that breaking with the, the mold, you know, it, it requires, you know, taking risks. And so I think creating a context where folks can do that work and, and, and you know, push for that without the sorts of strings attached and, um, you know, worrying the next year or the, in two years, if you'll have enough money to run the community center. I think is is you know is key from from where I sit. I would add that you know funding organizing that invest in the development of people with lived experiences um, that invest in in the development of people who've been excluded from you know organizing spaces like women of color uh, women who have um, have had uh, interactions with the criminal justice system. Um, you know, at Community Change, uh, we support the Women's Fellowship Program as well as Power 50, both of which center and uplift uh, women of color and um, recognize that they've been, they have led struggles all along and we need to, to support, support them. Um, and so investing in, in organizing that advances policy platforms that win change and shift narratives um, and, you know, through the years that I've interacted with organizers and grassroots leaders, uh, you know, I've really gotten to learn about how engaging in these important fights uh, affects people, it affects families, it affects communities, regardless of the policy wins, which there have been many and they're so important. Um, but supporting organizers, especially directly impacted uh, leaders, mothers with small children, um, you know, so they can continue to do what they've done for generations, you know, making our, our world a better place for, for our children and for future generations. Um, and I absolutely agree with what Philip just said, you know, money without strings attached. I was having a conversation with, with a community partner, uh, you know, weeks ago about, you know, the struggles during the pandemic, writing up, you know, 4,000 word responses monthly because of a you know ten or ten thousand dollar grant they received and so these are the kinds of um to th the things that you know folks just don't have the bandwidth uh to to do that kind of intensive reporting um you know for um you know to to continue to do the organizing work that they're doing already so um thanks for bringing that up Bob. And what I'd add, and I'm going to say this not as a um, author of the New Deal for Housing um, Justice, but as Jeremy, um, is, you know, the philanthropy built up the housing advocacy infrastructure that we have today, the intermediaries, the policy advocacy groups, um, and, and the like. And um, I think it, there's a real need for philanthropy to think about creating a new infrastructure for housing justice. Because I think that we can all agree that that infrastructure is not delivered on housing justice. And I think what is needed is an infrastructure that's built out of movement space, spaces and that is led by movement leaders of color. And that means every part of it, from the policy ideation to the political strategy, to the advocacy strategy, all the way through. They choose the partners that they want to work with. They work, they choose the people that are going to help them build that infrastructure. And that is what I think the role of philanthropy is needed is to build that housing advocacy infrastructure within movement spaces that are led by movement leaders of color. <clears throat> Great. I think we've given uh, philanthropy their to-do list for sure <laughs> there. Um, I'm going to turn to a, a couple of questions from the chat right now, or at least some themes that have been coming up re repeatedly in the chat. So one is, and it's something that a couple of you have mentioned also, the role of community land trusts and cooperatives and other community controlled, um, but yet private groups, not public groups, um, entities, and how you know, what what is the role for those kinds of organizations? How should they be? How should we be thinking about them when we're thinking about social housing? How should we be thinking about them in policy and and support their creation in a in a useful way? Uh, 
Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll weigh in on this. And I think one, of course, it's about, so there's a lot of like, there's been this kind of treatment of um, land trust and cooperative uh, models as kind of this like niche thing that isn't like can't be mainstream and people always talk about scale and what i'll say is that what i believe is the challenges to scale are the structural inequities in the housing market and by addressing those structural inequities within the housing market and then also providing the resources and funding necessary to these kind of community driven community ownership models is the way towards scaling these things up because if they are in competition with extractive forces in the housing market that are unrestrained by government, they're always going to be put on this, they're always going to land in this niche space. So these two things have to happen at the same time. There has to be capital available to community land trusts so that they can purchase land, redevelop land, and do all of the things that they do really well. But there also has to be forces on the on the policy side to to tear down the systemic inequities that make that work that they do so damn difficult so that's what I, that's kind of how i would respond to that that you, it's not a choice you have to do both at the same time <clears throat> great did jennifer or philip do you have anything burning to add to that or should we yeah i, I echo everything i think that's sounds exactly right all right um there was another uh question I'm going to scroll to it right now, but it had to do with uh, the conversation about home ownership, which got brought up briefly, and how we think about supporting Black home ownership in the context of Black neighborhoods being devalued, right? So we've seen in, in Andre Perry's Know Your Price and things that there's there's appraisal gaps, there's systemic discrimination in terms of, of that. And so how does that affect how we approach looking at equalizing home ownership rates? So uh, home ownership is, is a huge predictor of, of wealth. And um, you know, lack of home ownership is one of the many ways in, that exacerbates racial wealth gaps. Um, and you know, we really need to think about the exclusion of people of color and black people from owning a home and, and address that um, because you know, communities, entire communities were redlined and they were not given the, the choice of, of buying a home. And if they were, their mortgages were much, much higher than other people. And this continues to happen specifically for, uh, for, for black, women of color. Um, they continue to receive and pay more for their homes because their interest rates are higher. And so, you know, we haven't really touched uh, much on, on the effects of housing and women in particular, uh, but, you know, stepping on, on a slightly different topic, you know, women comprise uh, three-fourths of people living in public housing, you know, three-fourths of people who have a voucher. And so we need to talk about the gendered aspects of housing inequity that intersect with racial inequity and, and other areas. But um, you know, finding ways of supporting people and ensuring that that systems aren't set up for folks to fail, both in not being able to access uh, buying a home, but also being able to keep their home, right? And and that that that's really important. It's one thing to you know to be able to 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 buy a home, but then it's a it's a very uh, different thing to be able to keep them to have a an interest rate that's that's um, reachable. Um, and so I think both have to be thought about um, at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. No, I definitely echo everything um, that Jennifer mentioned. I, the things that I'll add is, you know, the, the home ownership piece, when I think about it in my head, it's always sort of a, a tricky one for me um, because of what we know about wealth and its relationship to, you know, the ability to people to, to build lives and futures. But the other piece is that it's so deeply entrenched in market driven factors from, you know, the interest rates to the mortgage sort of uh, process. Like 
to being able to even get a mortgage, which is related to credit, that it, it's so embedded within these market driven factors that it, it, it becomes slippery to just sort of, in my mind, to just sort of like, it, and I think that's what the question is getting at is that there's this legacy of redlining, this legacy of, uh, you know, predatory and extractive, uh, you know, lending and evictions and the like that really had been shaped by, you know, the, the censoring of profit over people. And, you know, I think that a part of any framework around sort of the home ownership piece has to be about thinking about, you know, the pieces around banks and predatory lending and all of these factors that, that, that you know, have in large part created a lot of this, the housing crisis that we see today. And I think it's important to hold that. The other piece that I mentioned is that I think it's very central to, to have a framework and a lens around reparations and how we approach you know, this question around like home ownership and sort of like in, in housing in general. Because I think for all those folks that, you know, were given, you know, uh, in terms of blockbusting and redlining and given, you know, predator, uh, uh, predatory, um, uh, you know, mortgages and lost their homes and folks that were not able to get in. And we know that wealth sediments, right? It doesn't just go away. And so in, in, when we think about the legacies of, of the sedimentation of wealth and inequality, housing, of course, has been, you know, the, the, the sort of at the center of how, um, you know, uh, sort of racist policies have been able to embed themselves, you know, institutionally. And so I think having a framework around reparations and, and, and that being central into how we think about, you know, creating a context where people can, you know, and communities can own their homes and, and the land that they, they they live in, I think is very, very, very important. And I think it's, it'll be essential for, for actually creating sort of a, a just and, and, and you know, um, uh, yeah, sustainable future as it relates to housing. Great, thanks. I'm gonna try to fit a few more questions in here. We have, uh, we have several. One is, um, does the New Deal and the BREATHE Act uh, distinguish between corporate real estate owners and small mom and pop, you know, two family homes with a resident owner. And how do you think, I'm gonna add, how do you think that we should, if we should approach those differently in policy? I think regardless of who you rent from, tenants at a baseline need to have protections. And that's one of the things I've looked at in the New Deal for Housing is that we need to have a federal you know, federal level protections for tenants, uh, regardless of who they rent from. Um, but, um, you know, I think primarily the focus is on, on corporate landlords who, um, you know, who often are, um, are, are not seeing their tenants as, as people, but as profits. And so um, that's, that's problematic and, um, and you know um, something that needs to be addressed. Yeah, I I agree with all that. The one thing I'd say is that I think we there needs to be a focus as it relates to corporate landlords on the impact and the that they have on displacement and gentrification in communities because they control so much real estate in many communities. So when they are doing mass evictions, when they are grabbing up large swaths of land and flipping them, like these are the things that I think need extra attention that is different than like a small owner buying a building and then renting it out. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to have, we should wrap up because I want to have a couple people do some closing comments. I'm sorry we didn't get to every question. There's a lot of good conversation going on in the chat. And, um, but I want to turn it back to um, Farron briefly for a call to action. And then I'm going to ask my uh, co CEO and publisher of Shelter Force to close us out. Great, thanks, Miriam. I just quickly wanted to um, speak particularly to the folks who are representing philanthropic institutions or are um, uh, donors or you know have philanthropic ties. And I just wanted to issue a quick challenge to um, to folks who are in our network and also in philanthropic institutions. And my challenge, and it's a today challenge. It's not a sort of later. It's a challenge I'd I'd encourage you to try to take up today. And the challenge is to think about the wealth 
that your philanthropic institution is distributing and where it comes from. And think about the relationship of where it comes from to what you've heard on this call today. And the second part of the challenge is, is then think about as you deepen your understanding or revisit your understanding of where the wealth was originally generated from, what is the responsibility to today's moment? And I really wanna emphasize the today of this because um, what I think we forget sometimes, I wanted to thank our speakers is that oftentimes in philanthropy, we are privy and privileged to a lot of information. So, you know, the folks who are on this call have really helped to enlighten us and I'm really grateful for that. And I wanna say that the gratitude isn't enough that actually this is labor and you've heard a lot about extraction and unpaid labor and, um, I want to make a declaration that it's our responsibility to honor that labor and to see what we can do. Like folks put this webinar together and present it on this webinar for a reason because they want to actually see this advance. So that's my challenge to folks. I hope folks um, can take it up and feel free to reach out to me if you have any interesting results or if you need help in figuring out how to do it. Like I understand you might not have the playbook, but it's like, you can figure it out and networks like NMG are here to support you in that. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. <laughs> Thank you, Farron. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Shalon Hawkins. I am the CEO and publisher of Shelter Force, and I want to thank you all again for taking your time out today to attend to, a, to attend this webinar and this rich conversation. There was much to be covered um, and still probably more to be covered um, in the future. And that is something that Shelter Force is looking forward to doing, is hosting more conversations and partnering with more individuals to have these courageous conversations. There was one thing that Jennifer said to me that really, that sh she said today that resonated with me was about the protection of black and brown families um, and also taking in to considera consideration that when we're engaging into these conversations to be ensure how we engage with folks that are black and brown because we don't want to extend or evoke any emotional labor um, by requesting them to be a part of the solution but making sure that it's all of us working together um, both black brown and and those that don't look like us um, so again, thank you all. Um, please look for a follow-up. Um, we will have a detailed follow-up um, that will include the recording, also how you can contact our speakers. Um, and if you have any questions or you would like to, to have, or you have ideas about future conversations, please send an email to info at shelterforce.org. And thank you again for our sponsors, NFG. Thank you, Ford Foundation. Thank you, funders together, um, and all of the other folks that helped make this happen, especially our speakers. And Miriam, my partner, thank you. You did an excellent job today. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everybody. And we look forward to being in touch with you again soon.